Hey everyone, namaste and welcome to this evening's conversation with Dr. Kausuk Desikachar in search of mind. Yeah, so we're actually trying to do at least like a three-part series and the first part was uh, the last session we had and this is actually another session continuing with the same theme of the mind and I really hope you will enjoy this extensive delving into the intricacies of the mind. So those of you who are here listening in, please say hi in the comment section and please enter your questions as well. Let's try and make this as interactive as possible. Now, uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Shailaja Menon and I have been a yoga practitioner and teacher for 22 years now. I began my journey in Coimbatore, India with Integral Yoga and continued in Malaysia with my teacher Manoj Kaimal. Now, along the way, I set up my yoga studio, Matt and Beyond Yoga Studio. I published my book, Yoga Shakti, in 2018. And now I currently host a yoga show on RN TV based in the U UK, also called Yoga Shakti. So as you can see, the yoga has shaped my life. Now, I would like to add that all of these conversations are available on our FB pages as well as our YouTube channels. Yeah, so I'm taking this opportunity to ask all of you to check out our YouTube channels and also to like and subscribe to them. Yeah, you will really enjoy the content. Now, Kaustub, as most of you know, is a renowned yoga teacher, yoga therapist, and author, continuing the classical yoga tradition of his eminent grandfather, T. Krishnacharya, and father, T. K. V. Desikachar. Now, Kaustub's grandfather, T. Krishnacharya, is considered the father of modern yoga, and the revival of modern-day yoga is to a large extent attributed to him and his legendary students, who also include Guruji B. K. Zayangar, Guruji Patabi Joyce, and Kausup's own father, Guruji TKV Desikachar. Now, Kausup began studying yoga when he was only nine years old and under his father and began teaching by the time he was 13. He has a dual master's degree from the renowned Birla Institute of Technology and Sciences and a doctorate from the University of Madras. Kausup conducts teach training and therapist training programs around the globe and he travels eight months of the year to Europe, China, and other parts of the world. Now, he has also authored several books, to name a few, Hatha Yoga Pradipika, To Serve with Love, a tribute to TKV Desikachar, The Yoga of the Yogi, The Legacy of T. Krishmacharya, and his most recent one, Truth Unclouded, The Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. Now, his objectives include the sharing of authentic teachings of yoga to the modern era and building bridges between different healing modalities to promote physical, emotional, social, and spiritual health. So now uh, over to Kausu, who's going to open uh, with his uh, very well-known uh, chanting. So that's a treat for most listeners. So let's get started. Namaste, Shailaja, and namaste, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. And uh, it's a wonderful pleasure to be back on these conversations. Uh, since we are going to talk uh, about the mind, which Mr. Patanjali has so beautifully described, I would like to uh, you know, um, start with the chant towards, uh, towards Patanjali. Om Yastyatva Rupamadhyam Prabhavati Jagataha Anikadha Anugrahaya Prakshin a clay Vishama Vishadharaha Anikavatra Subhogi Sarevagnana Prasuti Bhujaga Parikaraha Prita Ye Yasyanityam Devo Hishaha Savoyat Sita Vimalatano Yoga Do Yoga Yuktaha Yogi Nachita Sipade Nabacham Malam Shari Rasyacha 
वैद्यकोत्तम प्रवर मुनीना पतंजलि प्राजलिस्मी आबापुषाखार शंखचक्रासीधारिण सहस्र शिस श्वेत प्रणमा पतंजलि श्रीमते अनंताय नागराजा नमो नम पातंजल महाभाष्य चरक प्रति संस्कृत मनोवाय दोषाण हर्त्रे अतए नम भाष्यकृत्सूत्रापे निर्मल स्वरूपिण ध्या श्रीपते पतंजलि नमाम मणिभ्रा विश्वरावंडलाय अनंताय नागराजा नमो नम ओ Namaste, my dear friends. Thank you, Kausluk. That was really beautiful. And uh, as we get started, so when we were trying to decide, you know, what what should the topic of this uh, conversation be? Uh, you know, we we're talking about the mind, and several options came up. And then Kausluk came up with this title. He said, you know, in search of mind. So then I said, uh, mind or mind, you know, like the mind. And he said, it's there's not just one mind. And then he also told me that, you know, this was actually the title of a book by his father, T K V Deskachar. So I was quite curious about that. So we stuck to this title. So I'd like Kausluk to tell us a little bit about, you know, the book that his father wrote, you know, with this similar title. It's and so... I'd also like to say hello to everybody here. Sorry, Kausluk. Sorry, sorry. So many no, of no. you know our friends who are here. So just really thank you all for taking the time to be here. Um, you know, from Viji Kutimai, my aunt, and then there's Geeta from the UK, and then there's uh, Tanuja, Erika. Prakash Kansami, so many of you here. Thank you so much, and of course, uh, Dr. Balaji, thank you so much. I think you're on vacation somewhere, but uh, thank you for tuning in. Uh, Mona Lisa Singh, uh, just thank you. Sorry, Kostu, carry on. Wow, you went like a rocket. You read out most of the names. You forgot a few names, so I hope they don't feel offended. <laughs> you forgot the Chandula and Rose Highland. I was looking at the attendance sheet. You know, you were going. <laughs> So I didn't go on top. I just saw the last few. <laughs> anyway. Sorry, my apologies. I am very grateful to each one of you here. Truly appreciate your presence here. It's your presence that make our conversations happen. No problem. No problem. Actually, it's so fascinating because um, yesterday uh, in the evening, my mother and I we were sharing the dinner, and my mother got a phone call, telephone call. from one of my father's students called uh, mrs vasanta surya who is actually very fascinating because she is the one who edited the book in search of mind for for my father actually in search of mind was a series of lectures my father gave which mrs vasanta surya had edit uh, what you call transcribed and put it out in a very beautiful form of uh, a book and uh, that is uh, one of the books of my father and in this my father is actually exploring different themes like first of all the mind is an instrument that has been given to us for a particular function so what is the mind about so first is he is exploring the mind then the next chapter is about mastering the mind see when you want to use an instrument you need to master that instrument and uh, when you master that instrument only you can use it effectively 
then what do you do once you have mastered with it what is it what are you going to apply it for that is where the concept of expressing our potential and our dharma comes in so these are three important sections of the book and this is something that we all have to reflect about we have been given a mind for a purpose and that is what we have to use for uh, in a positive and an appropriate manner rather than just use it uh, in a, a, a random manner but in order to learn how to use it obviously we need to learn to master it first and that is what the yogis do so can we uh, start with that like uh, what is the mind and then also that very fascinating reply that you gave me that there is not just one mind but many minds so yeah <laughs> i don't understand why it's so fascinating because in the on the one hand there is one mind and on the other hand there is not one mind so let's take for example an individual let's say for example we take you shailaja you are the same person right but you are different for different people for your parents you are a daughter for your children you are a mother for your husband you are a wife for your students you are a teacher for your teacher you are a student now obviously it's the same person but it's all different to it's different to each of these different circumstances the same way even though the mind is one instrument it can function in different ways and what is it that makes this differentiation it's the same like in your case it's all the energy so obviously the energy of your relationship between you and your parents is one thing the energy of you and your husband may be one thing your energy of you and your children may be one thing between you and your students is one thing so depending on that energy field that energy that makes that connection obviously you are changing your role you are changing how you function within that framework of that relationship the same way when we change the energy field in our system the different mind structures becomes dominant that's why in yoga we are working always on prana energy so in the energy is a bit very very low level very distracted very disturbed <clears throat> very inefficient it's the energy that is connected to the sensory mind that is called manas when the energy is a little bit more uh, uh, subtle or a little more uh, in uh, subtler than the uh, manas mind we get into what is called the asmita mind the ego mind and then comes the buddhi mind the analytical mind so there are three minds that are called external minds manas asmita or ahankara as sankhya calls it yoga calls it asmita and buddhi the intellectual analytical mind now these three together are called the external minds that means the minds that are useful for external transactions then comes the more subtle minds that is called chitta pratyaya and sattva chitta mind is that mind that can make the connection that can sustain a connection which is useful in for example in dharana that's why patanjali uses the word chitta in dharana pratyaya is a more deeper much more fluid mind where the energy becomes even more efficient even more subtle and that is what is called the fluid mind the mind that is there in the state of meditation or samadhi and the ultimate mind the most efficient is when the prana is the most efficient most subtle called sattva the mind becomes sattvic there what we call the silent mind it becomes a mirror of reflection of the consciousness nothing else so that is why we have six different kinds of minds even though the mind is just one instrument it can transform its nature into six different varieties based on the efficiency of energy and that is why we need to focus on the prana prana is all important in yoga and that is why all the yogic masters were asking us to focus on the prana i think is absolutely fascinating like how uh, you know eventually everything 
is about is you know prana and even through the prana the different minds or two can be identified and defined and yeah really beautiful cause so thank you so much for sharing that and uh, so i just wanted to go like you know i had these different questions but then you know after you told me how your father uh, you know talked about these different segregations so i'm quite curious about that as well so i'm just going into that second section that you talked about mastering the mind so uh, how how what are the techniques that uh, were used to master the mind oh shaila ja thank you for this question but you will not like my answer <laughs> most of the people listening to here today will not like the answer patanjali's view and it's not my view it's patanjali's view and this is what my father also took the only way the only way i'm telling you to master the mind is through the heart that's why my father called his work the heart of yoga not the mind of yoga if you want to master an instrument called the mind which is already a subtle instrument more subtle than the body obviously you need something that is even more subtle in order to master so for example you are in a chariot right you want to control the horses the horses cannot control themselves there is a charioteer who is controlling the horses oh that charioteer is the mind the horses are the senses who is controlling the charioteer because the charioteer can go wherever he wants there has to be the passenger who is sitting in the chariot hey go here not there so oh, that my dear friends is the heart that's why patanjali says hridaye chitta samvit <clears throat> the word chitta represents the heart mind the mind that is close to the heart because we have to go there and this is very fascinating because many many people they travel long distances to achieve what is called peace of mind they travel long distances to learn yoga teachings and this and that but in yoga shastra in yoga philosophy the longest distance you have to travel is basically from head to heart that's all you don't need to go anywhere else and this is unfortunately the answer most of you will not like because you want an external answer not an internal answer patanjali's view is that peace of mind clarity of thought wisdom etc all comes from the heart prana's location is in the heart so if you want to influence prana you have to go to where the prana source is right and that is in the heart so that's why yoga is not an intellectual process it's a process of connection from the heart <clears throat> so heart we have to travel to the heart stay comfortably in the heart and heart does not mean emotions it's the place where our light is our clarity is etc and that's where we always have to go inward that's why patanjali shastra is what is called antaranga sadhana which means an inward practice exercise physical fitness is an outward practice but yoga is an inward practice now many people don't like this because when you have to go inside you have to look at the garbage inside what the hell is wrong with us it's very easy to blame outside i can always blame outside for my problems much more easier because then i don't have to take responsibility to correct it but heart will never lie i think i told this in the last interview or somewhere the heart will never lie mind is a liar so people who are always intellectual they are full of lies they will say whatever they want to suit the audience that they are trying to reach so to one audience there will be one way to another audience there will be another way but heart will not lie because it cannot lie because it is close to the consciousness satyam is from the heart it's not from the tongue ahimsa is from the heart it's not from your hands because you can think that you want to hurt somebody same way 
all the yama and niyama are from the heart only only underline that with red color pink color blue color etc mind can lie again and again and again to suit and people will say ayyo ade vera ide vera in tamil they will say that is different this is different that's the mind telling us to play the game heart will never lie so that is why if you want to master the mind then you need to go to somebody who is more powerful than the mind who is disciplined who will not change again and again imagine if you are a gymnastic student if the teacher is telling you do this one day do something else another day do this another day do that they they teach, keep changing their narrative then you will learn you will have no confidence whereas if you are in your heart seated in your heart you will not change that's why love is from the heart it's not from the mind it's not in the mind because your love cannot keep changing one day to another oh i love you today i don't love you tomorrow now i'm not talking only romantic love i'm talking about every kind of love just because it's convenient or inconvenient we cannot change that is mind playing that games so this is what is the important way to master the mind we have to go back that's where all the yoga sadhanas the practices are all called antaranga sadhana because they are things that take us inward not outward only when we go inward we can master the mind when we go outward we get so excited by the senses it's impossible to master it and unfortunately unfortunately Patanjali says in the later sutras mind cannot be inside and outside at the same time you have to choose when you want external path you can or going in an inward path you cannot be external so you have to make a choice so we are living in a practical world what is called vyavaharika the level in this level obviously we are dealing externally because we are to deal with family we have to deal with our job we have to deal with rules of society and traffic jam and things like that but if we can give every day one hour for internal practices that has so much value if you can give more that's great but think about it one hour of 24 hours is less than 5% if we cannot give that to ourselves then we are not really worthy individuals because see any instrument has to have maintenance you maintain your car you maintain your bike you maintain your dishwasher you have to do that this is also an instrument that you have to maintain your mind and body are instruments that we have to maintain so give one hour my dear friends to inward practices like meditation mantra practice pranayama practice because when you do pranayama you have to stay consciously with your breath you cannot be outside you cannot listen to what <clears throat> neighboring auntie is doing or talking or cooking when you are basically practicing this so that is why give one hour it's enough just one hour it's enough this is what i would say as a starting point to master the mind the practices of yoga are presented by patanjali as the ashtanga yoga and there you can actually uh, get all the details of which one to do which one not to do etc okay thank so. you kaustub that was so so beautiful now i know that uh, you say that you know it's uh, marishi patanjali's teachings about the heart but i think uh, especially your father and you know they have really uh, brought out the emphasis on the heart like i you know i think uh, you're really focus on the heart your uh, tradition and i find that so beautiful and i always love it when you talk about the heart so i think our next conversation is going to be only about the heart so uh, that was really beautiful and uh, i think everybody listening has connected with that too so thank you for that and very very um, vital that one hour of conversation you know one hour of connection with the heart space kind of practices are so necessary see i'll tell you one small thing even though you want to acknowledge people like my grandfather and my father i understand that but they would no, not no no they would not like that 
acknowledgement because ultimately this is the teaching of yoga it's not there uh, it's it's actually uh, not their fault that they are the ones who are teaching it correctly in the traditional manner and the others are teaching it incorrectly with false understandings making very stupid statements as well it's not their fault it's actually the fault of the society that supports this kind of teaching which is of low standard and unfortunately that is what is Inter happening in yoga. it's called it's called interpretation kaustub and that's open it's not no no it's not interpretation i'm so sorry to say it is misinterpretation because to study yoga sutra in deep you have to go in depth to a traditional teacher who has studied this philosophy in depth there are fewer and fewer such people and unfortunately that is the problem and certain words in the sutras are technical terms you can't just use a dictionary to understand them they are technical terms what avidya means in in the context of yoga sutra is so different from what avidya means in sankhya so different from what avidya means in vedanta philosophy so it's very very important to understand that there are certain technical aspects but anyway i am saying this because i don't think my father and grandfather will want to take the credit for something that you are offering no i'm not offering credit but you know like his book also was a heart of yoga and whenever you talk also i've noticed there's really a lot of emphasis you know on the heart and then you attribute it you know to your father's book etc so yeah but i've heard a lot of focus on the heart which is really uh, very very uh, beautiful so just want to say hi i see uh, maria just please excuse my pronunciation but you know wonderful that you made it there's rose and vaishali there's also katya and uh, acharya mukesh so namaste thank you all for being here and i'm also seeing that it's a very quiet audience that we have i don't see any questions yet so guys uh, send in your questions and uh, let's get this uh, show rolling yeah so the next question kaustub is um, well we talked about uh, you know how to master and then finally i think the next question is uh, about you know expressing your full potential but i guess there are blocks in all of us that uh, we don't really like you know we all talk about expressing our full potential but what is it that prevents us from expressing our full potential so patanjali is giving us this clarity in the second chapter of the sutra um it's basically that there are five different types of blockages that we can have all these are mm, what we can call the blockages of the chitta the mind system the first and foremost is what is called avidya and this is what i said it's a technical term see many modern day commentators they just translate avidya as ignorance that's so stupid because ignorance is not ignorance that is avidya because when you look at the dictionary vidya means knowledge avidya means ignorance that's what they translate that's not right avidya is a technical term it is not knowing yourself with a capital s it's not that i don't know japanese or i don't know malaysian or i don't know chinese or i don't know cooking uh, that is not avidya i don't know astrology i don't know many many subjects i am not familiar with that is not avidya avidya is not knowing your true nature see we are all we are all having a true nature if we don't know our true nature then how can we express the true nature and fulfill our potential right you i mean each one of us we have a true nature <laughs> i am not a and we don't have certain nature i am not a singer you asked me to sing before in the backstage meeting before this talk i can sing for uh, one because it's not in my nature to sing people will run away i probably could sing but it's better reserved in the in the in the restroom when i'm alone and not for the <laughs> pleasure of others but i have certain other potentials you know we have this this is what is called avidya not knowing what is inherently our true nature now that when we don't know that that creates a range of problems one is asmita false identity if i don't know who i am i want to somehow 
fix an identity for myself that is different from my true nature i want to be like you or i want to be like somebody else it's not possible you talked about some of the people that are today present one lady has come today one of my dear friends vaishali she is a wonderful jeweler okay she is a jeweler now i cannot try to copy her because i don't have that skills same way you are wonderful in so many other things which i cannot do so we all have this but we try to copy somebody else i say oh you know what this i want to be like them i want to be like that i want to be like this it won't work it won't work my mother is a wonderful gardener i cannot be like her my hands are not so green but same way my mother cannot do what i can do so we have these kind of wrong identifications we try to be like somebody else you see the classic example right the dark skinned people want to be white skinned the white skinned people want to go tanning and become dark man want to be like woman woman want to be like man you see all these kinds of things happening i mean it's it's insane people don't want to accept that that is what is called asmita false identity then the, from avidya also comes what is called raga and dvesha the duality the opposites desires or expectations and aversions what you don't like what you don't want you want what what you want to hate this is also another blockage we all have this we like some people we don't like some people we want to be like some people we want to be we don't want to be like somebody else etc lastly the most powerful of all which is inherent in us is fear abhini uh, vesha fear it's so deeply programmed in us that we have fear my father always used to say avidya asmita raga and dvesha you learn after you are born but fear is programmed even before we are born so it's so deep so inherent this thing called fear and that is a big obstacle we have fear of success we have fear of failure we have fear to be ourselves we have fear to be like somebody else we have fear to express our truth we have so many kinds of fears we have fear of losing job losing income losing status losing our partner losing our children losing our dog losing our uh, cat losing our garden every time there is rains in uh, chennai now my uh, unusual rains my mother is so scared that all her plants will just die that's her fear so we have so many deep obstacles that are some of them are programmed some of them are inherent and that is why it's a challenge to remove these obstacles because even if we slack a little bit they will come back with great power so that's why patanjali during practice is saying nairantarya do not interrupt your practice you have to keep sustaining the practice you give a little space the whole thing will come back with a bang and you'll have to put some more effort into this process so that is why we have the obstacles the blockages which is the five afflictions of the mind that is called the kleshas this is one simple answer we can go much more deeper this is a simple answer that patanjali has given for the second chapter students in the fourth chapter he will go even more deeper into this topic okay so i guess we're not going into fourth chapter now <laughs> uh, i mean it's up to you it's uh... you could give us a taste of that <laughs> since i think a lot of people here are yoga students yeah so in the fourth chapter patanjali talks about certain things that are called vasanas impressions that we inherit from our ancestors 
that we accumulate from our own actions, our own experiences in life, as well as the environment in which we are living in. The environment in which we are living. So sometimes, without knowing, we are taken over by the vasanas. We are taken over by the vasanas. So this is very, very important because certain impressions we have, they are not even conscious. They are not even conscious. These vasanas are sometimes subconscious. How, you, how we relate with man and woman is generally modeled on the examples we have seen in our family and in our society that we are growing up in. We cannot help it. Whether we like it or not, that is what we are growing up with. Before the media and internet was so explosive, you only saw people in your neighborhood, in your families, because there was no Facebook and uh, videos and uh, cable TV in those days, when I, at least when I grew up. Uh, even though, I mean, I am 16 years old, you know, but always. <laughs> Uh, it is, uh, things are changing. So this is called vasanas. Vasanas is another obstacle because we function through these impressions and we think that what our impressions are is actually the impressions other people have as well, which need not be the truth. So we impose our value systems on others and that's where there are some conflicts. I think it's very interesting how you talk about, you know, that some of the vasanas we carry are also passed on to us from our ancestors. Correct. So I Correct. think we try to spend a lot of time, you know, figuring out, you know, where we got this from. And, you know, we don't even realize that it may not even be our own. Correct. And these could be imprints that we inherited. Now take that sentence together with avidya. We don't know our true self because we don't know much of our inherent nature that we have inherited because many of them remain unconscious. That's why we need to put ourselves in out of the comfort zones to know ourselves. How will we react in a, 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 yeah, an uncomfortable zone? I'm so privileged because I've traveled to so many countries with so many different cultures. It's put me in uncomfortable situation in so many occasions where my real nature has to come out. Whereas if I was only living within my own cage, I would not realize all those things even about myself. True. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah. So it's really very interesting takeaway that we really don't, you know, we all think that we know ourselves, but we really don't know ourselves and that we carry the impressions of not just our own actions, but, you know, I think impressions from other lifetimes, impressions from our ancestors. And I think this whole lifetime was not enough to discover our own true nature. So anyway, uh, moving on from there, uh, there's a question here from Maria. Thank you for your question, Maria. It's the first question that's come up. So in these times facing the pandemic, would you think the biggest obstacle would be fear? Um, <laughs> well, I was, uh, I was going to tell you already when you said to the people, oh, please ask questions. I was so sure that Maria Alejandra Sierra Hernandez from Colombia will ask at least two or three questions. You give her the license to question. <laughs> um, um, fear may be the predominant uh, obstacle during the pandemic, but it's not the most fundamental. I think the most fundamental problem with this pandemic is avidya, because we don't know the truth. We don't know really what is this pandemic all about, because it's not consistent. You see. Uh, they don't allow more than 20 people to meet for a wedding or a funeral. But yet, when you watch the TV, there is the Olympics where there is hundreds of people hanging around in the stadium. Even though there is no audience, the staff, the support staff, the colleagues, and everybody. I was watching today when 
uh, you, I was watching a little bit of uh, the Olympics before our conversation, and you see so many people are together. So what's the truth? What's the truth there? So I think the most fundamental is avidya, but the most expressive is fear now. The expressive is fear, but the most fundamental problem is avidya, because we don't have clarity about this. So I hope Maria is happy with that answer. And um, so just going back into the Klesha's Kaustub, you said something you know, very interesting also about how Abhinivesha is actually inherent and is there in us even you know, when we're born. So is it possible to eliminate the Klesha's completely? I mean, even Abhinivesha, which was there in us even as we were born? You can, remove, yeah, uh, you can remove, yeah, uh, you can remove you, you cannot remove all the kleshas altogether, but you can reduce it. But you can. To a such a degree that it is sleeping, it's impotent. Pratiprasava. Prasava means potent. Patanjali uses the word pratiprasava, impotent. You can make them impotent, which means they are not acting on you. But if you give them a little chance, they will come up. So rather than waste time on removing the problem, eliminating the problem, anybody who tells you that you can eliminate your kleshas, you can take for granted that they don't know what they are talking about because kleshas cannot be eliminated. Even the chant I did to you in the beginning towards Patanjali, Patanjali is described as Prakshina Klesha Rashihi, in whom the kleshas are minimized. See, the word is very clear, minimized. It's not absent. The only person for whom the kleshas are absent is Ishwara, the divine. Whereas any other entity which has the combination of Prakriti and Purusha is going to have Kleshas because Prakriti is defective in nature. By nature, it has defects. So we cannot say that we will have a situation where none of these Kleshas will ever exist. It can be minimized and that itself is enough. That itself is enough. So the next question that follows will be, how do we minimize it? <laughs> this is very beautiful because Kleshas, even though the, we consider them as mental problems, mental afflictions, the way to reach them, to minimize them is through a holistic approach. That's why Patanjali is giving us Ashtanga Yoga. We need to change our attitudes, yama and niyama. We need to do certain physical practices because body will hold toxins that are coming from the kleshas. We body will hold toxins which we need to eliminate. So we need to do different asanas based on what where the toxins are located in the body. We need to do certain kinds of asanas if the toxins are in the lower chakras of the body. We need to do certain other types of asanas if the toxins are in the upper section of the body, etc. So that is where asanas also come. Then we have to do some conscious regulation of breath because if there is these blockages, prana is not flowing smoothly. So we need to make the prana flow smoothly. We talked about raga and dvesha, right? Desires. How do we control the desires? through controlling the senses. Pratyahara is there. How do we eliminate avidya? How do we eliminate fear through, through practices that discipline the mind? Dharana, dhyanam, samadhi. So that's why we need a holistic approach. It's not something very casual. It's not something that is very casual. Unfortunately, this means that we need to take responsibility. So it will only work for those people who are willing to take responsibility 
on their own path. It is not going to work for people who just want a quick fix. Oh, let somebody else solve my problem. And unfortunately, modern medicine has given that kind of an attitude. You get Corona, take vaccine, you'll be okay. You have cancer, don't worry, we'll do surgery. You have heart attack, don't worry, we'll do surgery. But nobody is teaching them, the doctors are not teaching them. What is it that made you get that damn heart attack? If you change that, you won't get the heart attack. But they don't want that because if they do that, they lose a customer who will pay the top dollar to get a surgery. And people are so happy to pay the top dollar because they don't have to do the work. The doctor will say, don't worry, sir. After surgery, you can do everything the same. You will have perfect health. It is not a truth. It's a lie. The guy will go again. He will push himself to work 70 hours a week and get heart attack second time. Oh, don't worry, sir. We will do fix it. So by the time the person is dead after three or four <laughs> interventions, the doctors have made enough money and they don't have the like James Bond, they have the license to kill. <laughs> they charge and they drive fancy cars. They they are so wealthy, like James Bond. They don't have any limitation on spending. Unfortunately, that is what has brought the mentality. I'm not saying that medical system is always like that, but we have gotten into that mentality, and because we don't want to take responsibility, we are exploited. And that is the problem. So as we yoga is teaching us that we need to do the holistic path. But again, it's a daunting task. It doesn't mean that we have to start in a very big way. That's why I said start small. Give one hour for your internal practices. This one hour you divide it into three parts. 20 minutes move your body through asanas. 20 minutes do some breathing, conscious regulation of breath. 20 minutes do certain meditative practices using some mantra or using certain images of the gods or the goddesses that you like. It's okay. Or even images like mountain or a river or a lake, etc. Whatever you want. 20, 20, 20. One hour per day is about 4.8% or something like that. If you can't do that, then you don't deserve good health. <laughs> I'm not joking. Can we not do one hour per day for ourselves, for our health, so that the remaining 23 hours will be healthier? And once we start doing it on a regular basis, this will accumulate. 20, 20, 20. It's a simple formula. You don't, you don't have to complicate it. Start with whatever asanas are possible for you. Conscious regulation of breath. Try to breathe in and breathe out as smooth and as long as possible. The key word there is smooth. Can you stay 20 minutes with your breath? That will be great. 20 minutes, meditate. I mean, this is a general advice. But if you have a teacher, access that teacher and develop a personal practice for you. And that is the message of the book, Heart of Yoga. Developing a personal practice. Because each of us, we are different. We are not the same. So what works for one will not work for another. And that is why we need to develop a personal practice. I think thank you so much for breaking that up. Uh, I think that was the question in my head when you say spend one hour on yourself. I mean, people must be still thinking, what do I do in that one hour? So you have uh, clarified that and you have actually given people a system to work with 2020, 2020. And uh, yeah, so I guess this also ties in with uh, Vaishali's question about uh, what asanas help to minimize. Are there any specific asanas or like you said, just do whatever you want kind of thing? Yeah, I mean, very simple asanas, like we can start with some very simple Surya Namaskara. If you do it with some breathing regulation, if you do four rounds of it, it will take you about four or five minutes and then you do certain simple twist asanas, then you do certain squats like Utkatasana, etc. Then you do certain lying asanas like, you know, uh, Bhujangasana or Shalabhasana. Then you do certain seated forward bends like Paschimottanasana. When you do just about five, six asanas, 
it will be enough because you have done 20 minutes. I'm, I'm giving this as a very general idea. What will be more useful is if you can develop your own practice. And you talked about, you know, these toxins being located in different, uh, you know, spaces in our bodies, different chakra points. So how does one, I mean, is it you have to go to a yoga therapist to find that out? Or how would you know where your problem is located, where your toxicity is located? Is there any way that we can find out for ourselves? Um, of course, there are different uh, signs and symptoms that you can you can identify with when you see where the toxins are and things like that. Because when Muladhara is imbalanced, you will see certain signs. When Swadhishthana is imbalanced, you will see certain times, etc. So you need to learn those in order for you to identify it yourself. But still, we it's, it's always better to go to a very, very well-educated and qualified teacher who understands this system because there are many dimensions in this issue as well because unfortunately, unfortunately, please forgive me, it is not that we only have toxins or defects in one chakra. If that was the case, we are so... If only one chakra is the problem, we are so lucky. Usually we have combinations and therefore the combined effect will have to be uh, understood. Secondly, there are polarities in the chakra, both on the left and right side as well as up and below. Sometimes the problem with the Muladhara may not be because of the Muladhara, but because there is a problem in the Sahasrara chakra because they have a polarity. Or it could be the Anahata chakra because Anahata chakra has a polarity with every one of the chakras. So there are certain combinations that also exist. And so for this is a very serious study. And this is what I'm saying to you, my dear friends. Unfortunately, in the modern times, we have brought yoga to a state of very great disrespect because we give teacher training certificates, yoga charya titles too easily just because somebody is doing 200 hours or 300 hours or 400 hours of teaching. Yoga studies minimum requires 10 to 15 years of full-time study, not part-time. 10 to 15 years of study. I studied with my father 25 plus years. Full time study. I lived with my father, studied with my father. I took classes. It was not just like I just was in the same house and I was playing cricket and he was teaching. No, I took classes every day. In front of me, there are so many cupboards all filled with my handwritten notes. So we need to train and that will take a long time. Again, it's not a quick fix. That's why all the answers I give people don't like because I'm not giving them what is pleasing to the ear because I can say, oh, in two days, I'll teach you all the chakra secrets. If somebody says that, they, they are bluffing you, they're cheating you. Even if they say in 500 hours, I will teach you the secrets of the chakras, they're bluffing to you because they, you cannot do that. Part of the diagnosis of the chakra imbalances is through pulse diagnosis. And any responsible Ayurvedic doctor or yoga therapist will tell you, my Ayurvedic doctor told me this, and I was very young, he was teaching me, Dr. Sheshadri told me in 1997-98, he told me, how stupid you'll start understanding the pulse after you've taken a minimum of 10,000 times the pulse rating of 10 different people. So calculate how long it's going to take. So I can't just touch my hand and say, oh, you have this problem. Because it's not. And I cannot teach pulse diagnosis online. I have to sit. I used to sit with my father when he was seeing patients. He would take the pulse reading of a patient. Then he will say, take it. I won't understand, but he will just say, take it. Eventually, it started making sense. So these are all things that we have to learn long term. But I'm hoping some people will learn. You know? So we have a question here from Kagan Kalita. So uh, they want to know what is a good practice to open the Agnya and Sahasrara Chakra? These few examples. You see, I just gave the situation some time ago. Everyone's, uh, it's very, very individualized. Very, very individualized. Uh, 
so it's not possible to just randomly say something like that however there are certain bija mantras for the different chakras for example for the agnya chakra the bija mantra is usually am or om and for the sahasrara chakra is om so if we use those mantras in the practice to some degree we can affect that but that's only a very very minute answer it's not the big answer okay thank you for that so the last question was actually um, you know kausal it was about whether you could share some of the practices that you personally do you know to uh, keep your mind in a good space and you know like mental health has become such a big issue these days and everybody's talking about it and especially you know the corona has also made it such a huge topic so share some tips that our listeners can go away with <laughs> i'm i'm not giving one hour a day i'm giving a little more than one hour a day so <laughs> again people won't like my answer because they prefer probably to sleep <laughs> i am waking up usually at 4 o'clock in the morning and i have my usual morning coffee and i start my asana practice that combines asana breathing and mantras and i'm usually finishing it at about 5:30 or something like that then for half an hour i go for a small walk so i can there is some physical activity as well but especially during corona so i want to go outside then when i come back from that i have my shower and all that but importantly i do my puja that is like a meditation practice i do a puja that is like a meditation practice and then uh, in the afternoon i do a pranayama practice and in the evening i do again i go for a walk for one hour which is usually the time sometimes i'm calling you or i'm calling our dear friend balaji just to catch up so this is normally the practices that i uh, i'm engaging in because that is what gives me sanity of mind and peace of mind and the other thing that i've learned now more recently is the power of stepping back the world will bait us to get distracted some student will create some problems or some neighbor will create some problems or some family members will create some problems life will bait us with distractions what i have learned is stepping back from that bait is the greatest 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 way to have a peaceful mind if we get trapped in that bait then it's a problem and very rarely i i'm also posting so much on social media social media is a disease and no person with intelligence and clarity and especially a teacher must spend so much time on social media because that is a toxic thing and it will only disturb your mind it will not you don't need to tell the whole world every moment of your life what you are doing you don't need to post on every post that people are doing you don't need to post about everything that you are doing it because those are all distractions i stay away from that as much as possible uh, because that is very very important as well so we have a question here from erica that she does a practice early in the morning and then later in the afternoon so what do you think about it it's good it's very good yeah. okay it's very good that she practices i know her because i know her uh, she's not a young chicken anymore she is an elderly senior citizen so if she can do 40 minutes in the morning and 40 minutes in the afternoon it's wonderful continue erica a bit a bit a bit yeah so uh, kausu thank you so much for sharing your own uh, personal practice with us 
and I think it's uh, certainly inspirational for all of us to hear, especially the waking up at uh, 4 a.m. in the morning. So, yeah, I'm sure our listeners are going to set their alarms a little bit earlier from tomorrow onwards. And uh... <laughs> I would be so happy if anybody who does that, who changes their lifestyle to wake up early and start giving one hour per day to post a comment on our video on Facebook tomorrow and day after and ne next day that they've done it, that they've done it. That would be a great sign. You know, if you don't want to do it on Facebook, just send us a personal message to Shailaja or me. That's also okay. Yeah, so uh, really, I mean, all of these conversations are for us to expand our minds, right? See how other people live, what other views are, and, you know, try to incorporate something into our own lives to shift our lives and minds into a better place. So this has been a truly enlightening conversation, Kaustava, and uh, thank, thank you so much because through you, we gain glimpses of, you know, your uh, legendary ancestors as well and uh, we get to access their wisdom as well so uh, thank you so much yeah we have rachel here who says early rising is the best yes early rising is the best and uh, yeah so maria says she's done it for three months now at 4 30 a.m so that's great and i think we have very inspired uh, students and people listening in on our conversations so thank you guys and always always extremely Happy to see all of you here, and I'm going to ask uh, Kaustuk to close with his chant. He gave me very strict instructions that we should close in one hour. Should I sing or chant? <laughs> okay. Up to you, Kaustuk. <laughs> no, no, I will chant, but I don't. I don't think singing is my strength. Om Shanno Metra Shamvaruna Shanno Bhavatwar Yama Shanna Indro Brahaspati Shanno Vishnuru Krama Namo Brahmani Namaste Vayo Twameva Pratyaksham Brahmasi Vameva Pratyaksham Brahma Vadishyami Ratam Vadishyami Satyam Vadishyami Tanmam Avatu Tadvaktaram Avatu Avatu Maam Avatu Vaktaram Om Shanti 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 Namaste my dear friends. Thank you so much for that, Kaustava. It was really beautiful. And guys, keep in touch with us. Look out for our posters on our upcoming talks. I'm sure we're going to do another one uh, again on the mind or maybe the heart this time. I'm not sure yet. So uh, yeah, keep tuning in for these fascinating talks and we'll see you until the next time. Yeah, Thank you so much for being here. Namaste, dear ones.